All right, there we go. So welcome to a uh, little talk about managing our uh, Ruby projects with RVM. I'm going to try to go very quickly. There's an awful lot of stuff in, actually in RVM at this point, and I just can't cover it in half an hour. So we'll see what I can get through. Okay, how many people have not heard of RVM? Raise your hands, please. All right, good. Um, how many people are using RVM? All right, that's, that's not bad. Um, how many tried it, it didn't work, and they're just not using it? Find me later. <laughs> All right, so what is it? Uh, RVM is essentially the Ruby version manager. Um, it's a command line tool. It allows you to uh, type RVM at the command line uh, with various options to do all kinds of kinky things with Ruby interpreters that uh, are not quite natural. Um, so it allows you to do several things like installing multiple you know, Ruby interpreters, versions of them, patch levels, and uh, revisions. It allows you to manage uh, sets of gems for each of these installations. Um, now Matt's managing at the systems level, uh, environmental level, not within your application. That is the better serve for things like Bundler, for example, which I recommend for uh, managing your gems inside of your applications. Beautiful for virtual environments. Uh, performing operations over installed interpreters and gem sets. So if I have five different rubies installed and I want to do certain action against all of them, RVM will allow you to do that. And there are, like I said, a whole bunch of other items that you can do with it. And focus gone. There we go. The RVM website is rvm.beginrescuen.com. I'll leave it at the last slide. You can actually uh, check it out. Um, at the very bottom, the screen's kind of constrained, but there are a lot of things that RVM manages and does, and this documentation is currently maybe 50% complete, so, of the functionalities that uh, RVM will provide. <clears throat> okay, who am I? Well, real quick, I had uh, about 10 years of development experience, and I went to work for Engine Yard. I now work for a company called Academic Management Systems, doing uh, admission softwares and such things. I am a partner, a member in a company of Division by Zero, and with uh, two other people, Mark Joseph and Bill Chapman, downright brilliant folks. Uh, I have four children, all uh, under the age of five. Makes things uh, very interesting. Uh, sleep. Yeah, no. Um, I used to hack on Mongrel, Merb, a bunch of open source projects. Um, I'd love to help out when I can if I have a clue of what the, somebody's doing. Um, currently, I hack on uh, RVM, BDSM, DBM, and UPM in that order of uh, activity. So RVM obviously is the most active project and kind of sucks most of my time. Bash deployment and server manager, you funny people. Um, so yeah, RVM originally started October 2007. and uh, I started with a conversation with a coworker, Jim Lindley, um, best UI guy I've ever met in my life. Awesome. And essentially, we had a problem where we had four applications, and each one of those applications had to run on a different interpreter. So uh, we, had, we were using uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition for uh, one of our apps. Actually, yeah, one of our apps, and the other app had to be on JRuby, and the other one was on uh, a brand new app, and we decided to go with 1.9 because the performance characteristics are just phenomenal. Um, and it was a hard problem. I mean, essentially, we said, okay, the, we, it was uh, August 21st, 2009, towards the end of the day, I was talking with Jim, and we just had three simple requirements, and it's, we wanted to be able to easily install the Ruby interpreters that we were going to be using for these projects, and we wanted to be able to easily switch between these three Rubies and have the environments basically between development, staging, testing, CI, demo, and production be identical. And yeah. Um, I, like I said, I had tried it in 2007, and I failed uh, miserably. It was, it was a mess. Nothing worked. And it was an extremely hard problem. And I loved the idea. I thought it was a great idea. And I just didn't have it then. So I'm very glad that Jim encouraged me to in, try again, basically, and, um, because now we have RVM uh, as it stands today. So basically, uh, the day, a day later, um, after much thinking the night before and a furious day of hacking um, and changing diapers, 
Uh, basically, my first check-in was about 300 lines of bash code, bash scripting. Now it's somewhere like 4,000 something lines of code, but it has an awful lot of functionality to it now. And the first check-in actually worked. It satisfied our three initial requirements. Uh, it's pretty good. So why did I use Bash? A lot of people ask this. Um, first of all, it's installed on every Unix system I've ever seen. Um, it allows me to bootstrap uh, Ruby. I, I don't even have to have a system Ruby on our deployment servers for production and everything like that. I actually deploy the entire, I, I use RVM to install the Rubies to, or as each user, each user is essentially the project that's running uh, we run like Nginx and Unicorn, and the entire environment is self-contained in that user's directory, a project user. And so it allows me to bootstrap everything from scratch with no Ruby required. Um, it also allows Bash, I mean, when we're programming and we're doing like all the rake tasks and everything, well, you're working in a shell. I mean, you're either using Bash or ZSAH, or maybe you smell a little fishy. I mean, it, all three of those should uh, actually work at this point in time. Fish needs a little modification. But Bash, by doing this in Bash, it allows us to directly manipulate your environment that you're working in. And that's what allows me to basically have you guys so that you can type, uh, RVM use Mac Ruby or something like that, and be able to just type Ruby, gem, all that stuff. Not Mac Ruby, Mac gem, and everything. So it's a consistent API across every single interpreter. Um, why would the heck would you want to use this thing? Well, it, once it's installed, mind you, uh, and properly. It provides methods for running single command uh, against multiple Ruby environments at the same time. Um, so what am I talking about there? Let's look at a few quick examples. Installing, I uh, say you want to install 186, go Kirk, uh, 191 and JRuby all at, in one go, you just do this, RVM 186, 191, JRuby install, and it will go through in that order and install those three interpreters into your RVM directory. By the way, RVM is self-contained. It is, uh, by default, if you install as a user, not as root, it's located in the .rvm directory in your home. So it's usually safe to, you'll blow away all your gems too, so you just have to reinstall. But it's safe to just blow it away and start over fresh anytime you want. So that's kind of nice. Um, so using a Ruby, basically say, okay, I want to, in my current shell, use uh, 1.9. RVM use 191. That'll switch to 191. Gem sets, um, you can use the gem set feature of RVM to basically create a um, system level directory of sets of gems for specific projects. So you're messing around with Rails 3 and you don't want that to affect your current uh, work, right, for your uh, work. You can use RVM to just completely self-contain that you're playing around with Rails 3. So you can play around with Rails 3 on JRuby, you can play around with Rails 3 on 1.9 and all the other interpreters that it might run on, all at the same time. And actually, all at the same time, literally, you can open up uh, four or five shells, have a gem, you put a gem set in each shell, um, have each shell use a different Ruby, and all at the same time be running Rails 3 on every single interpreter for fun. And later, profit. <clears throat> so um, RVM tests, and somebody tried to convince me to call this testes. I, not a good idea. Anyways, um, RVM 186, 191, JRuby that we just installed previously, tests. Uh, so let's say you're using Shoulda, which is awesome, by the way. Um, and you want to run, run your tests, but you want to make sure your application is actually compatible with those three Rubies that you've installed, because this is what you're, um, maybe you have a JRuby reason you have to use it, and um, you're on 186 in your production, but you really want to get to 1.9 because it performs much better. Um, this, is, this will actually go through and run like basically rake test against each of the rubies, and there's different flags you can read in the documentation to allow you to have JSON summary output or YAML summary output or just a human readable summary output instead of the massive spewing of uh, stuff that you know, rake test usually does. Uh, however, you don't lose the massive spewing of rake test. That all gets logged to your current directory, you know, uh, log slash the Ruby version that it was in, you know, error log and um, test log or something like that. You could check it out. RVM monitor, similar concept. You can actually um, run RVM monitor and it, what it does is it watches your test directory. And some, something like auto-spec on steroids. 
It is, so it watches your, your test directory. You change a test, and it will actually run your test suite. Uh, or actually, I think it just currently it targets the test to run uh, whatever test you changed against all three Ruby interpreters, and it gives you feedback right away. If anybody starts using that, let me know. Um, it's, I did it. It worked for me, but um, you'll see later why I'm saying that. RVM benchmark, so let's say you have a little chunk of code, and you're like, hey, huh, this would be cool to know how this uh, runs in the different uh, Rubies. Just take that chunk of code, slap it in with any require statements that are necessary right above it in a blank file in my code.rb, and run the uh, bench RVM benchmark command against it, and it will run benchmark bmbm against those three and r report the output. Um, da -da -da. Um, Again, that's a feature that I was playing with. So if somebody's interested in help, you know, I has ideas for it, see me. We could expand it. Hmm? Oh, he wants to know if you can like tweak the number of times it runs and stuff like that. I think the answer is yes. You just export an environment variable like n or something like that. But I, I'd have to look at my code again to remember. Um, you can use do uh, rake actions. Um, so basically, you select your three rubies and you, you know, rake, do it all, whatever you're gonna do. Installing RVM, there's about three or more ways to install RVM. Um, there's actually a lot of ways to install RVM since it's just a set of shell scripts. However, um, I definitely recommend the Git way. You can read it on the website. Updating, RVM update dash dash head. I re highly recommend that you get head on RVM often. Um, I've actually seen a few people do this and I recommend it as well. It's good. Um, RVM is kind of a fast moving project. so. Uh, so now that's the kind of overview of what RVM is, a kind of a feel for what you can do with RVM. Let's look at a few um, more uh, involved topics, and then hopefully I will uh, show you how I can fail miserably at live coding. Um, but yeah, we, so basically the idea of the, the meat of this presentation is supposed to be uh, how you can like uh, manage your workflows and environments and deployments with RVM. Hopefully I can get through it all. Um, RVM gem sets, uh, re originally it was just this kind of this homegrown ad hoc way of um, us being able to load a list of gems into our Ruby environments. And it worked great for us at, at uh, my company, but then kind of, you know, everybody started using it in the community and I put a quick poll out there, a lot of people responded and the, it was uh, pretty unanimous that we would make RVM gem set an, its own little API and it has all kinds of things you can do with the gem sets like creating, importing, exporting, deleting, emptying, so you can read that on the docs. But fundamentally what gem sets does is it exports um, your, in your current environment, RVM will set up a gem home, a gem path, and a bundler path. And this is actually how it facilitates um, segregating or um, isolating your different gem sets into their own little world so that they don't uh, interact with uh, other ones. So you can have each project be in its own little world at the system level, which is very nice. Um, the RVM development cycle is a little bit unique. Um, I haven't seen too many projects do something like this. I was kind of nervous to do it at the start. Um, extremely fast and furious. I, I essentially, I, um, I showed the initial RVM after it was a week old to uh, Jamie Van Dyke, uh, and he got rather excited. And the next thing I know, I was talking to some fellow named Peter Cooper, um, really nice guy, and. I don't know, it just kind of came out of nowhere. I was on this, uh, the RVM was uh, featured on uh, Ruby Inside, and then all of a sudden I had like an IRC channel with like tons of people in it asking all kinds of questions. So from the beginning, basically, I just kind of threw it out there. I released it very early in its life, and I released it very often. Um, releasing early and often was actually kind of cool. Um, what it allowed me to do is, I had a, basically an army of QA, and it, the army of QA is this awesome Ruby community that we live in. And unfortunately, by releasing early and often and taking on, oh, real quick, UDD, user-driven development. Um, basically, I didn't do anything unless somebody was going to use it. 
So I had people in the IRC channel all the time saying, hey, I'm trying to do this. I'm, can RVM do this? I'm like, well, no, but let's explore a little bit. And usually within a day or two, it did it. Um, so that was very cool, but at the same time, I, I just kind of grew everything from scratch, just throwing features in and piled out a lot of technical debt. Um, after, after some point, um, after I'd say like a, it was it was almost like a hundred iterations, decided to step back about ninety iterations, step back, think, okay, well, what can we do to the internals of RVM to? It's gonna blow. Five dollars. Is that what that is? <laughs> That's not a fire alarm, is it? All right. So, um, yeah, I can focus. So we reflected on the internals of it. I said, how can I make this scale better so that when we add features in the future, it doesn't break things randomly and. We did that. I, well, I did that. I sit there and I refactored the whole internals, made the directory structures so that they made sense, were separated, kind of uh, took. Originally, RVM was just one massive shell script. And uh, as, it, as the thing got like two, 3,000 lines of code, I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. So I took all the different functionality and I started uh, moving as much of it as I physically could into external callable uh, scripts. And the RVM essentially became this like uh, command line wrapper around this huge set of uh, scripts. And uh, they actually worked well. So moving forward, uh, I'm going to try to keep an eye open for um, places where I might be just kind of jerry-rigging the code to do what it needs to do versus uh, building it improperly, and hopefully we can avoid some of the speed bumps we had before one, uh, zero, one, zero. Um, zero, one, zero. After zero, one, zero, all the internal like refactoring had been done. Um, so now it's just for things like additions, like uh, adding the bundler path came after that, and um, it was pretty painless to add that actually. So, um, so let's just see. You know, what's the manual way for managing like a Ruby project in RVM? Well, you create your project directory, you can move into it, you select a Ruby you're going to use. So uh, if you want to track 1.9.2 development, you're going to uh, basically RVM use Ruby head and it puts that in your current shell as the Ruby. Um, you can create a gem set for this project. So gem set create project A, gem set use project A. And now you have uh, Ruby head selected with uh, project A um, gem set all set up and ready to go to be filled. So you just start doing gem install to fill up this gem set. And then if you check the um, gem directory, uh, like we can say RVM gemdar, which is basically the same thing as gem and gemdar, uh, you can see that it's got a Ruby dash head with a percent project A. And for those of you that like dash, get over it. Switch to bash or ZSH. Um, Yes, uh, so anyways, so this is completely separated, whereas if you just do RVM use 1.9.1, you're going to be, your gem directory is .rvm gems ruby dash head, that's it. Um, let's see, so this is a lot of stuff, and we really want this to persist. I mean, you don't want to just use this once. Basically, every time you go to this project, you want this environment set up. So RVM actually provides you some mechanisms to easily do that. Um, so all of that stuff can be condensed basically into one line. Um, you, you, well, except for the making the directory, of course. But once you're in the project directory, you want to set up a uh, environment using RVM. You basically just do RVM dash dash create. The create is a flag that says create the gem set if it doesn't exist. Um, otherwise, it will say, hey, this gem set doesn't exist. Create it first. And then dash dash RVMRC says, I want you to create an RVMRC with my current with, with what I'm selecting here in my current directory and um, use 1.9.1 project day. So that's going to basically do all that stuff where it sets up and uses the environment in the previous example, but it also has one additional um, item where it creates a project A gem set for the interpreter. It creates a RVMRC file in the current working directory, as long as it's not home. If it's home, it'll yell at you because the home and ETC RVMRC want, uh, RVM uh, RVMRC files are actually intended for modifying RVM's behavior itself. So make sure your project's not in your home directory. Um, so what does this get us? Um, yeah, Let's, let me just show you. So what I'm going to do
is Bigger. is it ah, crud sorry okay, all right so I'm going to make this directory and then as you can see there's nothing in it and Um, let's go so project A. So currently, well, that's a bad example. So currently, I, I have a 1.9.1 selected, and you can see, if you do RVM info, it'll show you basically your entire environment that's set up right now in that shell. And you can see that it's all Ruby 191, patch level 378, and all the different binaries and paths and such things. So now, if I do that line in the slide that I was showing you, it says using Ruby head with uh, gems at project A. So if I check the version now, I obviously have selected 1.9.2 dev. Actually, no. Whee! All right, so if I list, now if you see that directory, I actually have an RVMRC file that I created for me. Eh, that's interesting. So, if I do an RVM info, well now I'm, I'm using RVM uh, Ruby head with project A. So I'm now in this environment. Well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so, what is this RVMRC? Well, it's just RVM use Ruby dash head project A. So now if, uh, let's see here, switch to enterprise, oh, I don't have that installed. Do I have JRuby? Nope. Ah, no. I know I have 1.9. Oh, okay. Boom. Yeah, okay. So now I'm, my environment on this shell is 191. If I now CD to, um, actually I should show you the environment. So it's, it's definitely 191 patch level 378. Uh, no gem set or anything like that. If I CD to the project A directory, it says using Ruby head with gem set project A. Oh, that's interesting. So now if I do an RVM info, we see just by CDing into that directory, we have Ruby head uh, percent project A. So this is actually kind of neat. So let's say for this project we need, I don't know, Rake and uh, Rails takes a while to install. Well, I don't know. Sinatra. Fun with Ruby Gems. So, this is where you go and make coffee or something. Yeah, no, we don't need that. Okay. All right, so if we do a gem list, we see we have Rack, Rake, and Sinatra. And with Rack, Rake, and Sinatra, so I want actually this to preserve. I want this to be able to share this with other developers. So in order to do that, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to export my gem set to project A.gems. As you can see, it's literally just like the name of the gem and the dash V, the version. What this allows me to do is, let's say I do a project B below it, and uh, project B, currently I'm still in my old environment from project A, three. however, I, I want project B to be, let's say, let's, uh, I must have just had a, so I have uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition and project B. If I CD to this directory, eh? 
I see that I now have uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition, the latest one with Project B selected as my environment. I don't have any gems other than Rake installed by default. RVM gems at import uh, project A, I think. Yeah, project A gems. What it does is it just it basically gem installs the three gems that it was uh, requiring, which was Sinatra, Rack, and Rake. Hopefully, this doesn't take too long. You get the idea. It installs Rack, Sinatra, and it loads the gem set. It also uses a global caching mechanism so that if you've installed the gem on another gem set before, it will install much faster because it'll not go over the internet to do it. It'll install from the .gem file that was saved. So that's actually a, uh, so here we have project A, project B. So now if I CD to project B or A, I have Ruby 1.9.2. Or actually, I just did a, a. And now I'm at uh, Ruby Enterprise Edition. So it's a very easy way to you, for you to define your sets of gems, define a gem set, define what Ruby should be used for your project by default. I mean, nothing prevents you from running things against multiple Rubies. And I'm almost out of time, so I got to do do do. Let's see here. Yeah, so again, you can run specs against multiple things. I'd like to thank some people real quick. Um, there's a lot more things I'd like to show you, but I'm out of time. So uh, thanks to Jim, Lindley, Bill Chapman, Mark Joseph for all, all the encouragement and ideas and everything. Tyler Bird, this presentation, you rock. Um, Tim Brandes, uh, he, did the, he redid the new site look and feel and everything and how it's put together. He did an awesome job. Curtis McHale reviewed it and made some fine adjustments to it that were actually very awesome suggestions, so thank you. And most of all, from the Ruby community, you guys just rock. Lots of positive energy. Please keep it that way. Um, if you guys have any questions, please save them for breaks. I'll be at the Hackfest, RVM on Freenode. And uh, this presentation can actually be found on uh, Begin Rescue and, uh, RVM Begin Rescue and Com presentations, MWRC 2010. And the documentation is all on rvmbeginrescuen.com. And I use Pivotal Tracker. I think it's just a downright awesome tool for development, uh, tracking development of an individual or team. So definitely use it. It just rocks hardcore. Um, you can find the development tracker uh, linked to off of this presentation. And uh, there's a link to working with Rails on there for um, if you want to contact me or whatever. But the best place to find me is rvm on uh, Freenode. And if you guys try out RVM, you have any questions or whatever, you hop in there, ask. Um, I may be sleeping because some of you are in PST and stay up a lot later than I do, but um, I will respond. So hang around the channel and you know ask any questions. Remember, RVM is basically features user-driven development. So if you guys have an awesome idea that you think would be really useful to have in RVM, you know let me know. We'll, I'll work with you on it. We'll try to get it. Um, no, I will not rewrite it in Ruby. Sorry. Um, however, there's one guy that's trying to do it. He's got some really cool stuff. Um, that's about it. How much time do I have? That's it? Okay. <laughs>